Hey everyone and welcome back. Before we begin here today, please make sure that you like and subscribe because it really does help out our channel and it also helps us reach others in need of assistance with these topics. So in today's video, we are going to be covering centroids and this will be our first part in this topic series. So all a centroid is, when you have an object such as this shown on the screen, you are looking for the center, the geometric center of that object. So think of it like this, every single object ever created always has a center, a geometric center, a balance point, as you will, or you can think of it like that, where if you were to put this thing such as a position on a point, it would be completely level and balanced, not tipping to one side or the other. So that's what a centroid is. And a centroid will be made up of two coordinates when you are in a 2D situation. You will have your X centroid, which is just basically X bar, and you will have your Y centroid, which is essentially just Y bar. Now, there are multiple different ways that you can determine these, but what I'm going to show you is the, I would say the most simplistic way of finding your centroids X and Y for a 2D situation. So the X bar will be the summation of A times X divided by the summation of A. And I'll tell you what these are here in a little bit. And then Y bar will be the summation of AY divided by that same summation of A. So whenever you see A here, capital A, that is going to mean the summation of your area, your total area for your entire object. The summation of A times X and the summation of A times Y will be the summations of individual areas, once you break this object down into smaller parts, times the individual X centroid and the individual Y centroid. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now until we dive into it and we start working on it, then you can see exactly what A and X are for the individual portion. So, whenever you have an object such as this, that is not just a simple rectangle, a simple square, a simple circle, or a simple triangle. When it is not just a singular shape like that, it is called a composite shape. A composite shape is just one or, or two or more of those shapes put together. So if you look at it like this, we have a vertical rectangle with a horizontal rectangle attached together. We have two rectangles being put together. That is a composite shape. Anytime we have two or more objects or shapes being put together into a single one. So technically the name for this would be a composite shape. Now, whenever you have a composite shape, first thing you want to do is you want to split this up into individual shapes, such as individual rectangles, squares, triangles, circles, as many smaller parts as you can get it, get it into to make your life easier. So there are multiple ways that you can split this up. For instance, I could split it like this right here, where I have one rectangle right here, two rectangle right here, and then my third rectangle would be this vertical portion. So if I were to split it like this, I would end up with three shapes. Now, when you are splitting it, you kind of want to make it the least amount of shapes as possible to make your life a little bit easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it right here. So I have one vertical piece, which I'm just going to label as shape one, and one hor or my second horizontal piece right here, which I'm just going to label as shape two. So I only have two shapes for this object once it's broken apart. Now, the second step you want to do is you want to set an origin point. You want to set a coordinate system origin point. Now, this one already has one set up here with an X and Y coordinate system with the origin point being right here. So if that was not set for you, you want to make sure you set that and then have your dimensions um, off that origin point being positive to the right, positive going upward, and of course, negative to the left for X and negative going down for Y. So with an origin point set right here, all my numbers for this object, all my dimensions will be positive numbers because they are all going to the right of my origin point, which is positive for X, and they are all going upward for my Y, which is positive for Y. So I don't have to worry about any negative signs showing up here for those dimensions. All right, so the third step is start with a table. Now, this is what I said earlier about this being um, an easier path or an easier procedure to work with here. And this becomes much, much easier when you have way more complicated shapes. When you just have this two, per, or this two uh, single shape composite shape um, object here, this table method may seem a little tedious, but trust me, as they get more complex, this table method, it makes life 
so much easier, especially when you go on beyond centroids into what's called moment of inertia, the table becomes much easier for you. All right, so you're gonna have a couple of columns here. First one will be your shape and that will just be your numbers. And then you're going to have your area, which we're just gonna label as capital A. And then you're going to have your individual eccentroids for your individual shapes. Then you're gonna have your A times your individual centroids. And then you're gonna have your vertical Y individual centroids and then A times those Ys. So depending on how many shapes you have, that's how many rows you're gonna have plus an additional summation row. So since we only have two shapes, we're only gonna have two rows with a summation row. And the columns will always remain the same here. We will always have our area, A, or area, our X, AX, Y, and AY. Alrighty. So looking at shape number one and only shape number one, we're gonna do that one first and then we'll do shape number two. So we're gonna get our area, our individual area for shape number one. So we are only looking at shape number one. We do not care what shape number two is doing. We do not care where it is located, nothing. We only care about shape number one here. So let's get the area for shape number one. So that will just be one inch times the height, which is five plus one plus two, which is eight. So my area, which would be for shape number one, which would be eight square inches. I'm gonna leave units off until the very end here. So next would be our X individual centroid. So this is where you're gonna use your origin point here, which is this bottom left-hand corner. Now, once again, I'm only concerned with what shape number one is doing because that's the shape I'm currently looking at. So your X centroid will be measured from that origin point to the right here. So a centroid or a center of a square and rectangle will just be one half of the base and then one half of the height. So my individual centroid for shape number one will be located like somewhere right in here. Well, what is my overall width for shape number one? Well, it is one. So to get my individual X centroid, I will just take one inch divided by two. Well, that gives me a half of an inch. Okay, so then A times X will just be my A of eight times one half here and that gives me four. Okay, so now let's move on to the vertical direction here. Once again, my centroid is like located right here, right where the one is. Well, centroid, an individual centroid for a rectangle is just gonna be half your height. So it would be my eight divided by two here, which gives me four inches. So then my A times Y would just be eight times four, which gives me 32. All right, and that completes shape number one. Now moving on to shape number two here. So this is where you have to watch out for a little thing, a little trick here that shows up in the X and Y portions here because shape number one, its corner was contacting the origin point. So it makes it a lot easier. Shape number two is not in contact with the origin point. So there's a little trick you have to watch out for. So the area for shape number two is still gonna be calculated exactly the same way. This overall dimension is four inches. So that means that this is three inches right here. And my height is one inch. So my area would just be one times three, which is just three inches squared. All right, now this is where the trick comes into play. So looking at the X individual centroid, we are looking for this coordinate dimension from the center of this shape, which you know I should actually draw it in the center of shape number two. So it'll be from the center to the origin point. That is the dimension we are looking at for individual X for shape number two, that dimension shown there. So it will be this dimension, which is my width divided by two, and then adding on this dimension right here. So my individual width, which will be three divided by two, and then we have to add on this extra width for number one to get it to the origin point, which is one inch. So this would be three over two 
plus one, which gives me 2.5 inches in length. So then my AX will just be three times 2.5, and that gives me seven and a half. All right, now we're going to repeat that process for Y, keeping in mind, once again, number two does not touch the origin point. So we're going to have a little bit of addition here to get it to the origin point. So we are going to take this dimension, divide it by two, and then we have to add in this dimension to get it to the origin point. So it's going to be my height divided by two, which is one divided by two. And then we have to add in the two inches to drop it down to the origin point here, which would just give me 2.5. And it's just a happy coincidence that X and Y are equal for this shape. So then my A times Y will be three times 2.5 once again. And that gives me 7.5. Just a happy coincidence that A sub X and A sub Y are exactly the same here for shape number two. All right. So looking at what the actual composite X and Y centroids are, looking at those original equations that I wrote, let me get rid of a lot of the stuff here. We will have the summation of A times X over A. So we will need the summation of this column of AX and the summation of A here. And then for the Y, we need the summation of AY, this column here, and the summation of A once again. So let's go ahead and fill these in. So adding up these columns of eight plus three, that gives me 11. I do not need the summations of the individual X's, but I do need the summation of A times the individual X's. So four plus seven and a half gives me 11.5. I do not need the summation of the Y individual centroids, but I do need the summation of the A times the individual centroids, which would be 32 plus seven and a half, which gives me 39.5. Okay, so coming back up to these equations here, utilizing the table, I can just plug in my values. So the summation of A times X, which is this value right here, summation of A times X, which is 11.5 divided by the summation of A, which is 11. So 11.5 over 11 gives me 1.05 inches for my X composite centroid. And then let's repeat that process for the Y. We would take our summation of AY, which is 39.5 here, divided by the same summation of A, which is 11, because that's just summing our total area. So it'd be 39.5 divided by 11 gives us 3.59 inches. And all this is doing these equations are ratioing out how much area you have versus how much area versus the individual centroids for each shape. So looking at what we have for our answers here, do they make sense? Because these are our final centroids right here. You will have an X and a Y. They both are the coordinates. So does it make sense that those are my values? And those dimensions given will be off of your origin point that you set. So the origin point is plotted down here. But if you decide to put your origin point up here, your X bar and Y bar will be different values simply because your origin point is in a different location. Now, the end location of where X bar and Y bar lie will be the same, but it's just dependent upon where your origin point is. So looking at our origin point, we have 1.5 or 1.05 inches in the X direction. So we go 1.05, which puts us just past shape number one here. And then looking at our Y, we are 3.59 inches away, vertically away from our origin point. So that means that this is three. So we are up here somewhere, roughly about that location. So our origin point is going to be where those two collide. So this would be my actual X bar, Y bar location. And that would be my origin, my center, my balance point for this overall shape. Now, looking at that, does it make sense that that's where that's located? Yeah, it does, because this vertical piece is so tall that it's going to drag that centroid away from the x-axis. And this horizontal piece dragged it away from this center of this rectangle, away from the x-axis. So with this vertical portion being much taller and this horizontal portion jutting out here to the right, it's going to drag that centroid away from the origin point in those directions. Now, of course, it dragged it much further vertically because, well, look at the distance here. It's a lot further, uh, it's a lot taller 
then it is longer in the X. So yeah, you would expect the Y to be much of a higher value than the X based upon the dimensions shown here. Now, one more thing you might be saying, well, this origin point is not inside the shape. It's outside the shape. How can that happen? Well, it can. That's the balance point of the shape. It's not going to be necessarily inside the shape at all times. Think of a hula hoop, for instance, a sol or a hollow tube. If you think of a hollow tube, where is the center of that hollow tube? By instinct, you might say, well, it's right there in the center. Well, is that inside the shape? No, that is the hollow portion. The solid portion is right here with the squiggly line. So just because you get a centroid that is not actually within the boundary limits of your shape does not mean it's incorrect. It just happens to be outside the shape where your geometric center lies. So these right here would be your final answer. And most of the time, depending upon um, really what, who your professor is, um, you will have to show it on a picture such as this, or at least show your origin point if it is not given to you because those dimensions that you gather are set from your origin point. So that's how you would work that particular problem in centroids utilizing the table. And as I said, for a two shape, it's a little bit tedious to do the table, but as you get more complex shapes and you have to divide it up even more, the table is very helpful, and especially when you move on to the next topic after centroids, which is typically taught as moment of inertia. Those tables and setting up these tables will help greatly. So I hope this video was helpful, and if you want to see more problems solved this variety, please check out the other, other videos on our channel. Also, if you haven't done so already, please like this video, leave a positive comment below, and subscribe to the channel because all that does help us out greatly. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a fantastic day.